Well, I was 22 when I came on, fairly young and uh, pretty impressionable. And uh, I'd say I had a couple. I'd say one guy that taught me the, the ways of the fire department was uh, Jack LaFour, Jim LaFour's father. And he was a, uh, he was what some fire departments term uh, unofficially the master firefighter, which outranks a lieutenant. And that's exactly how Jack was. He uh, had a lieutenant, Jerry Knopper, good guy, but uh, Jack was in charge of the shift. He was in charge of the shift and he was in charge of the house. And I think anybody that works in the firehouse today can, uh, can relate to that. There, there's guys that are master firefighters and that's who Jack was. I, I, uh, I still say things that Jack said. I still, uh, you know, call certain things what, what Jack called him. He was a very, very impressionable, uh, good guy. Uh, missed, uh, missed greatly, but uh, he's the one that taught me how to how to react in the fire department. Uh, probably started my love for the fire department. Uh, another guy that was uh, Jack was on engine eleven with me. And back then we were slow. Uh, no matter what anybody tells you about three fires a day, everybody was slow. Uh, I was on a five-man engine company. We'd do 30 calls a month, and the busy companies were doing 60 calls a month. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, as crazy. It's nothing like today. It doesn't even compare to uh, our call volume today. But Jack was on uh, the engine company with me. Another guy that, was, uh, that made an impression was a guy that was a chief's aide. And the battalion chiefs used to get driven home for lunch and dinner, and the chief's aide would go stay at the nearest firehouse. And our chief's aide was Dick Bennett, and Dick was uh, another guy uh, admired greatly. He's still with us. Uh, don't see much of him anymore, but uh, ex-marine, not an ex-marine. There's no such thing as an ex-marine. Dick was a marine. He was squared away. He used to come and drill me during the lunch and dinner hours on the equipment, and uh, actually paired up with him a lot. At fires, there was uh, freelancing was the, the way we did business back then. Uh, there was, it was really no concern about splitting up with your your officer. And Dick, being the chief's aide, if I was the uh, the hydrant man on a five man engine, by the time I got water and got up to the truck, there was no uh, Scott for me. There were two Scots for five guys. Well, one's a pump operator, so two of the four guys went without Scots and. I never saw Dick with a Scott on, and I, that's where I learned to fight fires early on uh, without a Scott pack. I, uh, you know, they literally, as they say, you know, hold on to my code, kid. There, there was a lot of that early on. And uh, he taught me more about fire behavior, uh, about, you know, the right places to go, the wrong places to go, a stickler on uh, preparedness and equipment. And I'd say between Jack LaFour and, uh, and Dick Bannon, probably the two most. Uh, impressionable in my career. I'd say the uh, the superstar from my early years was uh, hands down. Anybody in my era is, is going to give you the same name. It would be Ben Lebunski. Oh, yeah. uh, still around. Uh, unbelievable shape for his age. He always was. He always looked, no exaggeration, 20 years younger than he was. Uh, and just had a real knack for firefighting. <clears throat> there were people that were jealous and would say he was a showboat and say he'd, uh, he was always posing and, and, and he was, you know. It, I remember fires where he had a rescue and he was sitting right on the front steps. Instead of taking the, the young girl that he rescued from the third floor to a remote area where it might have been a little safer, he knew, the, he knew where the good photo shots were going to be. But uh, smooth as could be, uh, being a five-man engine company, uh, I used to get, myself and Louis Nantista used to get Bob Barber to detail us first. We did not like being in a slower company and a lot of details, engine one, the squad, engine two, engine seven, the busiest places we could get to. And of all of them, actually Louis and myself both ended up on the squad, was to get to work the squad. The squad on A shift was a, a bunch of great firefighters and Benny being one of them. Pa Hirsch was with them, Jimmy Larson was the lieutenant. At the time, Jimmy Smith, Barry Dyer, uh, just just classic names in, in the Auburn Fire Department. And Benny, had we given awards back then, back then we used to give, uh, we didn't give, the, the Kiwanis used to name one firefighter of the year. And all these names I'm giving you, they, they all got it at one point or another. But if we ever had an actual medal committee like we do now, and this is part of the reason that uh, 
I've been active since the, the first metal committee formed, probably back in the 80s, and I chaired it for a while, and Keith Sapolo's doing a great job chairing it now. But we, we finally realized that there was uh, politics involved early on. Uh, for example, I had, uh, I had a pretty significant rescue early on in my career, and when I went to the chief's office with the special, which my battalion chief told me to do, I was thrown out of the chief's office because they had already named their firefighter of the year that year, and it was for starting up a bureau within the fire department. It had nothing to do with actions at a fire. So we started the Metal Day Committee. If, if we had that back when Ben Lebusky was grabbing people left and right, he would have had a chest full of medals. Just a real good guy, real good instincts. Got to work with him a lot, and uh, probably the one name. Right place, right time. Uh, there, there's so much, you know, people say there's luck involved. There's, uh, it's no different than golf, where if you, if you have a good day, that, you know, the, the saying is that the more I practice, the luckier I get. Well, it's the same thing in the fire service. It's, it's you know, Benny Lebonski was always there. On my shift today, uh, Jimmy LaFour and Billy Von Dolan are always right there. It's, uh, it's not luck it's if, if you're there all the time. But this was just my day where I was on rescue two. Uh, myself and uh, another firefighter, Bob McGraw, were first in at a pretty well-involved fire, Broadway at Livingston, and being on a medic unit was kind of like working a, a squad. So you're getting there, and uh, once again, we, we freelanced. There's, there's no beating around the bush with that. There was times when uh, you're there before battalion chiefs. At some point, you know, we were asking the chief what we want, but we, we basically freelanced. And uh, top floor was, was rolling pretty good, it's three story. Uh, got to the top of the stairs, the second floor, and it was charged up pretty good with smoke. And there's a guy in the hallway just standing there. And I told him to get out, and he said, I can't, I'm lame. And I said, What do you mean? You, you know, you're standing here. He says, I can't go down the stairs. And he also told me that there's somebody left upstairs. It was uh, kind of a squatter's apartment. They had been playing cards and drinking, and Everybody fell asleep drunk and, and the fire started. Well, this guy lived on the second floor and knew that there was still people upstairs. So I couldn't just leave him. Smoke started back down to the second floor. So I, uh, he was a big guy, probably six foot four, 240 or so. And I knew it wasn't going to be thrown over my shoulder. I didn't, you know, I'm uh, at the time probably 180 pounds, you know, quite a bit shorter than him. What I did is I, uh, with my tank on him, I gave him what we call a pack strap carry. I grabbed both his arms over my shoulder and I hustled down the stairs. I'm still wanting to be first one to the third floor. And then just like dropped him on the sidewalk. Turns out I broke his ankle going down the stairs because he was so much bigger. We got back up to the top of the stairs and it was myself and uh, John Prendergast, uh, another name that needs to be mentioned with these Ben Lebunskis, a uh, great firefighter. Matter of fact, a little, uh, little side on, on this fire. John and I were the first two searching the third floor, and on that very 20, same 24-hour shift, I watched John pull three people out of buildings. None of them significant. They were they were signal 20s. It was uh, two mattress fires and a couch fire. Now, don't forget, this is times. This is before we had smoke detectors, and mattress fires and couch fires were a lot more common occurrence. Now I think people have a cigarette, start burning a couch, a smoke detector goes off, they pour water on it, and we never hear about it. Well, back then, the smoke detector wouldn't go off, charges a place up, and uh, each of the fires we pulled up to, I was rescued to, John was a firefighter on truck to on Clinton Avenue, and three times, I'd never seen this before in my career, and talk about a fluky day, this is how we wrapped it up at three in the morning, but three times I saw him pulling unconscious people in one shift out the front door, never any medals, never any awards. Once again, if, if we had them back then, they were all significant grabs. But John and I are searching the uh, third floor. Got too hot, we had to back out, wait for the line. Ears burning, once again, no hoods. Uh, it, and it kind of worked out pretty good back in those days as, uh, as heat indicators. Got the, got the line in, pushed our way in. It was actually, uh, I found a guy face down in the, in the living room. Uh, Bob Woodward from the rescue squad carried him out with me, and uh, the other twist to this story is the guy was unconscious, we worked on him on the street, sent him to the hospital. Uh, never 
never heard that night whether he'd made it or, or whatever, but he was, you know, was deeply unconscious, not sure how much was related to the alcohol. But the next day, Bob Woodward, uh, the squad lieutenant, had lost his helmet shield in the fire. And as he's sifting through the rubble, he senses somebody looking over his shoulder. And he turns around and the uh, guy says to him, what are you doing here? He says, I'm a firefighter. We uh, had a fire here last night and I lost part of my equipment. He says, this is my apartment, get the hell out. And then Bob looked him in the eye and the previous night the guy was uh, covered in soot, you know, didn't get a real good look. But Bob said to him, uh, are you the guy that we carried out of here last night? And the guy said, uh, yeah, I am. Now, like I said, get the hell out of my apartment. So that's a thanks we, we got for that fire. But that's the fire that I, I took the special down. Uh, Chief Mike Romano told me, he said it was a good grab. Got a shot at State Firefighter, which paid $500 at the time. You know, that's, that definitely uh, had me interested. And took a copy of my special down to Chief Fitzmaurice and, uh, and watched him rip it up in front of me and said, do you think we don't know how to pick Firefighter of the Year around here? And it turns out it was uh, a lieutenant, I won't mention his name, that worked in the office at the time that got Firefighter of the Year. So if anybody hasn't heard that story, that's probably uh, the main reason why I chaired and why I, I'm still active in the, the Metal Day Committee. And there, there's good grabs out there and we like to see you know people recognized. Uh, I'd say now it, it's completely different from then. Uh, our, our, our department has always had a great reputation for being very aggressive. And there's still a lot of that going on today. And, and as a chief and having a, a different perspective now, a chief for quite a while, it's, it's, it's almost completely different from the way it used to be. Every one of us like to be the first one through that door. If you've got any amount of pride and, uh, and you're, you're really into the job, you want to be the first one through that door. You want to be the one putting the fire out, getting the rescue, whatever. And uh, those times have really changed. One thing that I push all my officers net to do now, and they're, and they're doing a great job with it, is somebody has to do a 360. Hardest thing in the world to do, because if you're on engine one and you're doing a 360 and engine seven beats you through that door, that's going to be the story of the fire. You know, where were you? And, but there's so much to be gained by that one walk around. And, uh, because uh, I'll be honest with you, I never did it when I was on the squad. I never did it when I was an engine company officer because I wanted to be that guy through the front door. And it's such a hard habit to break. But there's so much to be told for one person early on has to do a, a 360. Uh, the best examples I give, there could be somebody uh, hanging out a back window. Uh, Good example, I had a fire once with uh, four fatalities and I was on a truck and it was in Arbor Hill and I remember being on the stairs going for a rescue, everybody screaming, there's people in there and I was there with uh, Jack Wills, Ben Lebunsky, fighting our way uh, to get up there and make a rescue. Looking back, probably the wrong move for me as a truck officer. Had I done a 360, one guy died right at the back window, there was a male at the back window a woman and two children in one of the front rooms. First of all, you got to look at a fire and realize uh, it's time to cut your losses. It was fully involved in the second floor when we pulled up. But maybe had I gotten to the back one way or another, and there's ways, you know, people say you can't always get to the back. Yes, yes, there are ways, whether it's up over, roof and down, through an adjoining building. There are ways to, uh, to accomplish it. But just to, to do on every fire, to see what your conditions are, there's times when I'll have the whole first alarm assignment in fight in the fire all via the front door. I'll start doing the 360 and see it's a basement fire with the front basement windows glowing. So now I know these guys have to go all the way through the first floor, all the way back through the basement, where if one officer took the time when he got there, said, okay, we're going to fight this one from the back to the front. It's, it makes a world of difference. So it's, it's a different perspective from the chief's position. Uh, we're getting so much better. We're getting so much safer. Uh, Good example is uh, we had the two firefighters in, in Boston killed last week. It was a wind-driven fire. Ten years ago, nobody knew what a wind-driven fire was. Uh, we, we've been teaching it with high-rise. It all started with uh, the Dalla Ave fire in, uh, in New York City several years ago. We, we, we know about it. But e even there, who knows, had somebody gone to the back on Beacon Street and saw the wind was driving in that side, that maybe a safer approach. Once again, I'm not second-guessing. It's a uh, 
But it, it, if one person does it at every fire, it, it's going to be safer and uh, it, we're doing things safer and better than we were 30 years ago. I think you have to go right to safety here. Uh, yeah. I mean, we started out, uh, I start my 40th year in, in about three months. And we used to ride, if we had a five-man engine, we had three guys riding on the back step with two perfectly good jump seats that were available. Actually, the, I'll go back to the, the name I mentioned before, Jack LaFour used to ride in a jump seat and other companies would look at him and say, I can't believe Jack's riding in the jump seat, you know, and he didn't care what Chief saw and he, he just realized, you know, this is stupid to be riding the back with the wind in your face when you can, can ride in the jump seat. Not that there were seat belts or restraints or anything, but still so much more comfortable and, and you know, they're there for a reason. But uh, we had a guy a couple years before he came on. They got in an accident, and when you're riding a back step, there was a bar. He hit the bar. I think he had a cardiac contusion. Died, uh, you know, 23, 24 year old guy. I forget exactly, but uh, it was just so unsafe. We've had, uh, just in my career, uh, accidents with guys in the back step. I think it was Jim LaFour and, uh, and Pete Isabella riding a, a squad was using a mini pumper. They had an accident in, at an intersection, go flying. Uh, one story about Pat Thorpe. Uh, when I came on the job with a good friend from North Albany, uh, companies that were behind them, they got an accident, uh, fire at LaSalle, and I believe they were at uh, Ontario and Western, or Partridge and Western, uh, going west on Western, broadsided by a pickup, and the company behind them said he went as high as the, the top of the telephone pole and crashed down in the street. All unnecessary, looking back. I mean, you know, seat belts, riding inside, it's, it's bizarre. They used to, uh, I remember asking about it. First of all, the, st the stock answer was always, we do that because we've always done it. And one of the reasons they said we rode the back step was to make sure if any equipment came off, we could let the driver and officer know. So it seemed like years ago there was more concern, concern over uh, losing equipment than having a guy fly as high as the telephone pole. So I say safety is, is obviously the, uh, the big change. It was difficult if you were, uh, I, I probably would be considered one of the pioneers. Uh, 1976, I took an EMT class because, as I mentioned, I used to have Bob Barber detail me whenever he could to the squad. And the squad was the only company in the city that did, uh, it wasn't even EMS calls, they went on heart attacks. The squad had nine signals that they went on, and the signal one was a, a heart attack call. And I remember being on some of these calls and realizing there was only a handful of guys that were truly trained. You know, the guys checked their equipment and we had these uh, positive pressure respirator devices uh, that, looking back, there is the opposite of what we do now. We used to jam air in to people and everybody we worked on looked like they were nine months pregnant after about, you know, ten good blasts of air. But I realized there was only a, a handful of guys at the time. I think I can remember Ben Lebunsky was an EMT, Jerry Spath was an EMT. Uh, Tommy Grenier, Richie Sill, and these guys were, were good at it and the rest of us were pretty much winging it. And you know, we get there and we slap this mask on and fill somebody up with air. Never remember a reversal, I remember everybody vomiting after we worked on them. It was, uh, it was sloppy, so my wife Michelle was working at uh, Commission of Corrections under Scotland Avenue and they had training going on there and she was telling the guys that her husband's a firefighter and they said, well have them get in their EMT class. And it turned out to be Bill Hummel teaching an EMT class at SUNY. He hadn't been on the fire department yet, SUNY grad, with a few other guys that uh, turns out they were all great instructors and uh, learned a lot. I think it was two nights a week for a couple months. There wasn't much to it. It was uh, 30 some hours, I think, to certify as an EMT at the time. But because I had taken that, I ended up being one of the first paramedics and also the, stepped into training. And there was no lab instructors, certified instructor coordinators are just like, you know, you know how to do this train. We started training the entire fire department in, I think, 1977, 1978. And when we finally went online, you only did EMS calls if you had an EMT on your crew. So when I would get detailed around, once again, as a young firefighter, walking into a, a house with three uh, salty, you know, 30-year guys, the first question is, are you an EMT kid? And you'd hang your head and say yes, and they'd all, you know, get down the dumps. That means they'd had to do four more calls that day, and uh, you were pretty much on your own. You know, some guys were good helping you, some were uh, 
nope, you brought this on yourself, and, you know, we're turned black baggers, you know, the doctors and doing house calls. So it was tough early on. Uh, it, it, it was, you know, a lot of... A lot of stories where things didn't go quite so well. First of all, we had uh, no internships. You know, the first EMS call I ever saw, I was on. The first Signal 600 I ever saw, I was in charge of. So it was tough. Uh, it's, it's evolved so so much to today, but it was a sign of the times. We were uh, things happened a little slower in the Northeast. I remember in 1975, watching rescue out of California, saying, "Yeah, like that could ever happen here." And next thing you know, it's four years later, and we're up and running, and it's never stopped. So. It's, it's part of the fire service now, that's all there is to it. The hostility was still there when I came on. Uh, things have, have settled down a bit, but there were still the holdouts. There was scabs and non-scabs. And I was taught by my mentor, Jack LaFour, who to talk to, who not to talk to. Uh, if I get detailed to a certain house, uh, you know, this guy's okay, that one's not, and everybody on the job knew who the, the holdouts, who the scabs were, and, and who wasn't, and that was still there. And there was, uh, you know, there were words here and there, but all the uh, all the bizarre goings on, I'm sure Bob Barber filled you in on, you know, the, the fire at Delaware Avenue, and people being held out the window by their ankles, and all that stuff was gone, but there was still hostility over that. You know, it had, it had only been a few years. Well, there were uh, there were political, as there still is. There's there's guys that are political, and there's guys that were apolitical, and guys had gained by being political. And uh, with the union came true civil service. I mean, we had you know acting positions forever, and and you know I'm not saying that there, there's guys that you would be surprised if you ever heard that they were scabs. They actually turned out to be great union guys. Mm -hmm in the long run, but uh, it, it was a, a long-standing tradition that, uh, you know, politics ran the fire department. The, the, I worked with guys that had to go down to 75 state, which was Democratic headquarters, and, and pay their annual fee. I forget, I never had to do it. Once again, this was just a few years removed from it, but guys talked about going down and uh, paying your 50 or $75 for the year, and, and you're all set, and you're now, you know, your job was safe. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way of the city of Albany. You know, when I bought my first house in the city of Albany and I looked in to have my taxes lowered, I was told, well, you have to go see your ward leader and, and register as a Democrat. And that's, uh, that's the way, you know, things were, the machine was still in full force. Dan O'Connell was alive and, uh, you know, politics were, were alive and well. You know, Corning was the, the mayor and... You know, like I say, there, there was the divide. My class and probably a couple classes ahead of me never had to deal with part of our group. You know, I came out with a big group, 25 guys. We were all union guys, you know, and there was no question about it. But it was a tough struggle for the guys ahead of us that had the divide. You get distracted by other real events. Uh, firehouse closings. Uh, talks and layoffs. You know, it's often been said that uh, if you go so long without a fire in the firehouse, guys start getting on each other's nerves. You create problems. The best way to do away with those problems, get a couple good fires, get a couple good events, and everybody came together as a union. And that, that's what I saw. Uh, when I, we were years without a contract. We were arguing with Mayor Corning over everything, everything under the sun. He still did things however he wanted to. And we were just overtaking that at, at that time. The union was, you know, only five years old when I came on. And, you know, it all started, uh, I'm sure if you talk to some of the older guys, the snowstorm that they made guys stay for four or five days and didn't pay them, that, that was just going away. So uh, I think the events, uh, you know, when we went through Engine 3 closing, I was, at, I was an officer at Engine 6 when Engine 6 closed, and the, our union came together so strong over these events that I think anything uh, that would possibly divide us was, was going at that point. Okay. They were getting less and less, uh, probably from 75 to 80, but the, uh, the funny thing is I tell people now is as common occurrence as overtime is, where we're, my shift right now, there's overtime every day. There used to be just one 
eight hour shift of overtime for eight guys every year, all year. That was it. Uh, there was never such a thing as overtime except for election night, and it would be the eight senior guys, and they would man two pumpers, two reserve pumpers, and I forget what they even uh, what their numbers were. But they would go from fire to fire, basically. Uh, I remember working nights where, uh, like, you, like you mentioned before, three working fires going on at the same time. Uh, the ones I recall were always vacant buildings, which we had a lot of. You know, you go through Arbor Hill in the south end, every one of those vacant lots you look at, they were all row houses. And I don't remember any of them being catastrophic. I really don't remember uh, in the nights that I worked them, no injuries. It was, uh, you know, you're, you're either at a bonfire, uh, they used to throw the tires over the, the hydrants and light them. I remember uh, being on Delaware Avenue for a grass fire at Lincoln Park. and. It's something, or, uh, I'm sorry, leaf fire, and everybody had raked their leaves to the curb. The city must have picked them up. And I remember seeing probably 30 different leaf fires in both directions as far as I could go. Some of them must have just been going down the street. And that's his other fires where there's a fire going on. And I think we we're coming from the fire on Catherine Street when we caught that one. It was uh, pretty much Arbor Hill and South End, more South End. They, they held the election night fires more to a tradition than any other part of the city. But... Uh, it was strange, and then I started realizing that we weren't alone. It's you know comparable to Detroit on Halloween Eve, and uh, it was just a strange tradition that uh, that's totally gone now. But it, it was around a little bit when I started. Yeah, yeah they're they're so much better trained. Uh, once again, when I came on, we had two weeks of training, probably half of it in the classroom, half at the drill yard. Uh, there weren't the restrictions uh, that they're are now. I'm going to work with guys today. I think they got six weeks on, still haven't had a matter of fact, we scheduled a live burn. I think their first live burn is coming up in a couple of weeks. But back then it was it was live burns. It was, uh, I'll, I'll never forget, one thing we did was to go in and get a fire going, go in and see how long you could stay in it. And uh, I remember uh, Captain Fraley, who was, was quite a legend, you know, would try to make you stay in there until your eyes are water and you're getting sick and a headache and throwing up and uh, and it, it's ridiculous when you look back at it it's uh, you know so unsafe so unhealthy but these guys today they're uh, between the equipment and the training uh, all they need to do is uh, pay attention listen and one thing I stress and this will be my first time meeting this class and any class in the last 10 years that I've worked with is uh, my advice is just to keep learning there's there's so much out there the uh, it used to be you had to get a certain book. Uh, now, with, with the internet, there's I learn things every single day on the internet. There's not a uh, a May Day that happens in not just the country but in the world that isn't accessible the next day. Uh, anything uh, the the recorded audio. If there's a a fire anywhere in the in the country, we're listening to that audio the next day we come to work and we drill on it and it's. Uh, it's such a great learning tool. There's nothing like experience, and although you weren't there, you can you can live somebody else's experience and see what went right, what went wrong. So always continue to learn. Okay. Be my advice. There's so much proud tradition and history with the Albany Fire Department that I'm glad to see someone interested in, in carrying it on. Uh, you know our website. There's there's classic photos in there already. There's it's going to be a it's going to be a classic Facebook page by the time the rest of these photos get on there. And uh, when you look at the, the big picture, uh, you know it's 2014 right now. Our department's not even 150 years old. It's going to be here for thousands of years. Somebody needs to document the way things work. So I'm glad to see uh, an interest being taken.